Hi everyone, welcome back. It's Professor Hall, and today we are talking about Madeline Lingle's book, A Wrinkle in Time. We have a lot to cover here, so I'm gonna go point by point instead of previewing everything at the beginning so that um, if I go long, which I'm fairly sure that I will, I can kind of cut it, summarize, and then um, and then come back to start a second lecture. I don't want you guys sitting in front of YouTube for 40 minutes in one in one go. So um, the first thing that I want to talk about with Wrinkle in Time, the reason that I chose this book, um, I didn't get questions about any of the other ones, but I did get some questions about this. And, um, and so did uh, our, our liberal arts dean. Um, Madeline Lingle was once asked, why do you write for children? And she said, I don't and kind of left it at that. And the the idea that because a book has an adolescent protagonist, um, just because there's an adolescent protagonist does not necessarily mean that this is a book for children. Many people read this book um, when they're in elementary school or in middle school, um, but I think that the book has a lot of depth that younger readers don't always perceive and there's some scientific concepts that we're going to be discussing as well in terms of dimensions and time travel and and some other things um so we'll we'll leave it at that <laughs> there's there's a lot to this book and we're going to try to dig into it so the next thing that I want to talk about is the idea of fantasy as truth. I'm going to be giving you guys a um, lecture to watch from Madeline Langle. And if you're not in my class, I'll put it in the notes for this YouTube video so that you can go watch it yourself. It's about 50 minutes long, but I only need you to watch about the first 10 to 15 minutes um, just to kind of get an, an overview of some of her philosophies. But she talks about this concept of fantasy as truth and I think it's a little bit difficult possibly to understand so essentially for Madeline Langle you can think of um things on on kind of a continuum um that we have science at one end and that through scientific discoveries and theories that we um try to understand the world around us and some of that world can be explained through facts so we have um if you think back to the proto science fiction they were trying to understand the world right so um what does a microscope do and is it useful what does a telescope do and is that useful and um margaret cavendish was like microscopes are useful but telescopes just confuse you so don't don't use those um so the idea with fantasy is truth is essentially science is on the one end trying to explain things through facts and then on the other end <clears throat> we have religion and her her basic idea or premise is that not everything can be understood through fact and so therefore you have religion and faith and that explores deeper universal truths that science can't fully explain what i like about this idea is that uh, many people think that science and religion are diametrically opposed and they're really not um and and madeline for madeline engel these are kind of two sides of the same coin in terms of fantasy um, this is where some of the controversy of the book comes in, which we'll kind of dig into in a moment. But in terms of fantasy, essentially what she's saying is that um, with universal truth, you have things that are deeper than facts. Because of that, our brains as humans are kind of limited and we can't fully understand some of these universal truths or, or to... to comprehend truth and so therefore what we do is we use symbols um and we use fantasy we use she doesn't use the word imagination but people in the comments did and i think that they're correct um we use imagination to try to understand the world and um what's very interesting is i'm also going to be um giving you guys a video from a physicist explaining dimensions to people at various age levels and one of them is um, him talking to a nine-year-old and the nine-year-old says 
um, three dimensions. That's all the dimensions we have. That's all there is. And he, the, the scientist, the physicist says, well, that's all the dimensions we can see and we know about. But theoretical physics is trying to um, understand and we have to kind of imagine things and come up with theories of other dimensions to kind of figure out what else might be out there. So something like dark matter um, is something that we don't fully understand, <laughs> but it is matter where light cannot pass through. Um, it's like the Wonka factory. Nobody ever comes in and nobody ever goes out. So it doesn't emit light, but it also doesn't allow light to, to pass through. And we've been trying to understand that since 1933. Um, the fourth dimension, which we'll talk about um, later on, um, is something that many scientists still debate. So what Engel is saying is, uh, what Lingle is saying is that um, just as physicists sort of theorize what might be out there, um, in similar ways, religion um, is trying to explain the universe and fantasy is kind of somewhere in between. Um, and I, I would say to, to watch, I, I feel like I'm not explaining her, her idea well, but I would say to watch, um, her speech. I've also heard, um, he kind of talks about this in a different way. Um, but Stephen King has been asked like where some of his ideas come from. And he's like, I, I feel like I'm tapping into the pool of the collective unconscious, which is a psychological theory from Jung, who we talked about before, that we all have these archetypes that are kind of part of our culture and we're almost born understanding or knowing these archetypes. And for King, um, uh, the horror side of fantasy rather than the lighter side of fantasy, um, the, the archetypes are important and these kind of... Um, universally understood its symbols are important to coming to an uh, coming to the truth and that there seems to be some kind of truth in his writing even though it's horror or or in some cases with his dark tower series even though it's fantasy um and a lot of his stuff is a mixture so i think that many writers um play with this idea c.s lewis who madeline angle madeline Lingle kind of um i keep pronouncing her name wrong sorry guys madeline Lingle kind of aligns herself with c.s lewis who's a, a christian writer um he was an atheist and and a a scholar and then he um remained a scholar, but became a Christian. So prior to that point, he's really known for a lot of his work in mythology and um, Norse mythology in particular and some of his other scholarly writings. But um, we know him primarily from his um, Narnia series, the Chronicles of Narnia, where he uses um, fantasy and allegory to explain biblical concepts. And um, his space trilogy, which she mentions in her speech, I think she mentions it in this speech, is kind of another way of um, looking at how God might work on other planets and how that might compare or contrast to God's work on this planet. So it's speculation and science fiction and a little bit of fantasy and a little bit religion kind of mixed together. Um, so that's the first thing that I'd like you to, to look for. How are her philosophical ideas coming through this book? Um, we have science, we have fantasy, we have magic, we have religion, um, we have quotes from, from the Bible, we have mentions of uh, uh, Jesus, but also Buddha, and also some secular figures such as Gandhi, um, and sometimes the science is science, and sometimes the science is like, as my my college professor who, who taught my science fiction courses would say, it's stardust. It seems like science, but it's not really. Um, or it's, it is fantasy. But these are all ways in her mind, at least, of asking the questions, what if, um, how, and why? Um, what if there were life on other planets? Would those aliens... Um, would those aliens be 
sentient? Would they be kind? Would they be evil? Would they be working for the light in the world or against it? Um, what if we could travel through time and space? What if there were um, beings that were uh, stars or angels? Or what if our understanding of angels is really aliens? There, these are all kinds of questions that she's she's playing around with. So kind of uh, my next point going along with that. Um, so my first point is the idea of fantasy is truth and this continuum of science, fantasy, religion, um, magic kind of all mixed in together. Um, I'm going to tell you too, we're going to talk about the controversy in that video that I'm asking you to watch part of. She's going to offend pretty much everybody because she has some very unique ideas that are kind of just her ideas alone. And um, so she offends people who are religious and she offends people who are not religious. And um, but it's, it's an interesting talk nonetheless. So um, the second point, when taking all of this into account, what I think is quite interesting is that um, as the, the, the children travel through space, we have various genres of writing. So um, there is in the beginning of the book, almost a little bit of um, magical realism that it's it's a it's a dark and stormy night and um we have two children who are just awake and their mother is awake their brothers are asleep they're making themselves a snack um it seems kind of mundane and uh <laughs> it was a dark and stormy night is a cliche and i think she's kind of playing with that cliche a little bit to see where it could go from there but um the the scenes of um this family of we have scenes of meg in in high school and dealing with her principal and struggling at school we have um a few bits about how Charles Wallace is bullied. Um, all of that is, is quite mundane. And then we're brought out of that in this kind of hero's journey way that um, we'll talk more about with Ender's Game. But um, we're brought out of that and into some of the science fiction and fantasy mixed together because we have these three women uh, Mrs. What's It, Mrs. Who, and Mrs. Witch, and they are quite, um, they've been described as kind of witchy and mysterious, and so you have a kind of a little bit of fantasy there, but then there's also this discussion of a tesseract, which we'll get into later, which is a science fiction concept. As they travel through various planets, um, there is um, there's interplanetary travel, there's alien life, we have some pseudoscientific um, concepts, crystal ball reading, ESP um, on Earth and in the, in, the, um, in the travels. We have some fantasy, stars that appear as people um, and, and kind of flicker in and out and can only speak, <laughs> one of them can only speak in, um, in quotations. We have religion. There's a lot of discussion of God and good and evil. Um, science, there's a little bit of uh, evolutionary concepts that are talked about, which we'll get into later on. Um, so one of the landscapes is uh, dystopian, a dystopian landscape. And um, so what I find interesting about this book is we're talking about subgenres. It's quite difficult to place. And I think you could just call it science fantasy, but um, there certainly is a little bit of space opera, a little bit of first contact. Um, the children are the first uh, humans to come to this alien world, or so it would seem. Um, there is, um, yeah, there, there are a number of different genres kind of blended together. So I think that that is really connected with um, her her continuum of, of science, religion, fantasy, so that we have space travel, fantasy, coming of age, a hint of romance, a hint of um, uh, mystery, aliens, a quest, there's a, an adventure, um, and as I said, there's the dystopian landscape. So um, primarily, 
I can't say that this is any one particular genre other than to say that it's it's science fantasy, but it's all these other things as well. So I'd like you to look for that as you read the book um, with fresh eyes. How is she blending all of these various genres into one story? Um, the quintet, if you read all five books, is very similar. M many of the other stories also um, have this interesting blend of genre. So um, the controversy. <laughs> so I kind of hinted at this before. Um, because Madeline Langla has these beliefs about um, science and fantasy and religion, this book really makes made um, at the time it came out in 1962. It made really just about everybody angry, <laughs> and it's one of the most challenged books of all time. Challenged and censored are two different things, and sometimes people think that they're the same. So censored would mean uh, and banned is kind of a third thing. So banned book means that it's not allowed to be read. Um, the Dr. Seuss books that were recently taken off the market would be a good example of banned books and digital book burning, meaning that um, paper copies are no longer going to be printed and digital copies will no longer be available. Amazon sometimes bans other books from their site. Not many, because they want to make money, but they sometimes do. So um, a lot of times, kind of by default, if Amazon um, bans a book, it's very hard to get it into the hands of readers. So that can sometimes happen. Censorship, um, a lot of times we talked about um, an example of this with Flowers for Algernon, that some people had versions that were um, expurgated, meaning pieces were taken out. I believe that I was one of those those students. When I read it as an adult, there were parts that I did not remember. And I, I usually, as an English person, remember what I read. Um, some people had them blackened out. Some people had abridged versions. Some people were just given the short story that that novel was based on. So censoring various parts of the book, not allowing certain parts to be printed. Um, and then challenging a book basically means that it's in libraries, it's in schools, but um, people typically, parents will say, <coughs> people typically, parents um, will say to a teacher or librarian, this book really isn't appropriate for my child, or I don't really want my child reading it, or maybe we shouldn't be teaching it at this level. So for example, there might be a school where this is given to third or fourth graders. And because of some of the concepts, um, parents don't want their kids reading it. Or sometimes it'll be shelved in a library under kids books and um, parents or, or teachers will ask, hey, can you move this up and put it in the, the young adult section um, with certain YA books? They might ask for them to be put in the adult section. So there's a couple things to know here. Um, first, young adult um, or YA, we talk about quite a lot now, but it really did not develop as a separate genre or section of libraries until about the 1980s. Um, prior to that point, you really have children's books and, um, and adult books. And then you have some writers like Judy Bloom who are writing about um, 13, 14 year olds who are having experiences like being bullied for being fat in her book Blubber or um, having their menstrual cycle um, or um, she's talking about masturbation. She's talking about uh, people being peeping toms and that would have been shelved in with kids books because of the age of the protagonist. Highly challenged, right? So with this book, um, there's not any sexuality. There's not anything like what I was just talking about with Judy Bloom in the 70s, which kind of led to, um, in the 80s and 90s, this uh, separation of books for teens. Um, and now it's very, it's quite prolific, and a lot of books are crossovers, right, where young adults read them and then so do adults. Harry Potter is a good example. Um, but what's interesting about this book being challenged is that it really is because of the, these beliefs that Madeline Langle had about um, science and religion, because they basically piss everybody off. So you have people on the one hand who are um, 
a religious, they're agnostic, they're atheist, or they're of a different faith and than Christianity, some people who might be Hindu or Muslim. And they're challenging the book because of the Christian themes that they don't want their children reading a book with Christian themes because it it um, clashes with what they believe. Then you have people on the other hand who are conservative Christians and they don't like the book because it clashes with what they believe because it's mixing some new age concepts like um, the, the happy medium who is um, using a crystal ball to, to gaze out at the universe. Um, that kind of... Um, psychic type of thing would not be allowed if, um, or looked upon favorably by people who are conservative Christians. You have aspects of this um, where Charles Wallace seems to be able to read his mother's thoughts or to read Meg's thoughts. Um, so you have a little bit of ESP mixed in there. There are scenes where they're asking, um, they ask the question, who are the people who fight the darkness? And the children are um, thinking about this. And <clears throat> then the quote, um, the light shineth in the darkness and the darkness comprehended it not. So that's a quote from the Bible. Charles Wallace says, Jesus, that's talking about Jesus. He's one of the people who helped to fight off the evil and fight off the darkness. And then they're like, yeah, who else? Um, Gandhi, Copernicus, Einstein. So, we have um, a religious figure um, by a non-violent civil rights activist, Gandhi, next to a um, mathematician. Copernicus discovered um, the one of the people to discover the, the uh, heliocentric sun-centered model of our solar system versus an earth-centered. Einstein, who had the theory of relativity, right? So we have, uh, I think Euclid is also mentioned, who um, is the, the, the mathematician who developed the, um, the understanding of dimensions, which play a large role in this book. Einstein's theory of relativity plays a large role in some of those scientific concepts. Um, Gandhi plays a, a role in terms of um, this idea that love can conquer things. So for people who are of faith, having God put on the same level as Copernicus is problematic. And so because of that, um, people did not like this book and it was challenged quite often. So um, in terms of what you can look for while you read, I want you to think about how parents might react to this book if they are not people of faith or if they are of a different faith or if they are um, Christians. And I want you to think also about Madeline Langle's uh, concept of the heresy of love. The heresy of love basically says, that the traditional uh, theological understanding that God um, loves certain people and sends uh, and sends or allows them to go to heaven and um, allows other people or sends other people to hell, depending on how you think of that. We won't get into the theology here. <clears throat> but the idea that some people go to heaven and some people go to hell, she says, is a heresy and that it puts exclusions on God's love. And moreover, that people should not say who God favors and who God does not favor. Um, and so she's technically, um, she would say that she's Anglican, but I think really she's kind of creating her own religion kind of out of some of these various beliefs, or at least I will say not her own religion because that would involve ritual and um, literature. But... Um, her own faith practice. So those are some things that you can look for. Um, we're going to pick up next time. But just to recap, the idea of fantasy is truth and that there are universal truths, some of which science can explain through fact and some of which it cannot. The continuum of um, science, magic, fantasy, and religion and how they kind of intermix in this book. Um, three, kind of going along with that, how the book blends fantasy, um, religion, science, pseudoscience, um, which at the time in 1962, people were kind of like, 
like, could there be in a scientific explanation for ghosts? Could people read minds? Could people see into the future? But is there a scientific explanation for that? Um, four, the combination, again, kind of in keeping with that, the combination of the different genres of writing, science, fantasy, space travel, fantasy, coming of age, romance, mystery, aliens, a quest, an adventure, um, a dystopian landscape, all of that. And then five, the reason for controversy and the reason that people challenged this book. Would it be um, 60 years later still controversial? Um, if you had children, what age would you allow them to read this? And um, would you, if you let them read it, uh, if you let them read it, would you have discussions with them? Would you let them read it on their own and kind of come to their own opinions and conclusions? Or would you um, talk to them about it and what might you say? Um, so those are all things that I would like you to look for. Next time, we're going to be talking about the movie, which I did not like. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> Um, I really, there are some movies that I do like and that are very good at adaptations, but this was not one of them. Um, neither of the adaptations of this book were good. Um, the movie, which I did not like, um, the, uh, characterization of some of the characters, um, and we're going to discuss conformity and the political message. We're going to discuss feminism and then, um, most likely in a separate video, we're going to get into some of the science. So that is coming up and I'm excited to see your thoughts on this book and what you think of some of her philosophies. Thanks.